Hi, everyone, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lara Merling. I am a senior policy advisor at the Boston University Global Development Policy Center. And I'm very excited to moderate this panel about monetary sovereign, sovereignty in periphery nations. I think it's a very common criticism and conversation that we hear about MMP, that it doesn't apply or address the development context. So I'm very excited for us today to have this conversation on what this framework means in that context. And for that to start, uh, our first speaker here that we're very excited to have is Yan Liang. She is a professor of economics and the chair of international studies at Willamette University and the research scholar at the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity. And will tell us a bit more about MMP and development. Thank you. Jan, you have the floor. Okay, well, great. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm very excited to be able to um, share my uh, views with all my fellow panelists um, who are, Fadal was a long-term friend and we were in graduate school together. So I um, really always enjoy his insights. So it's a great opportunity for us to kind of share our views and maybe um, have some um, productive and you know, constructive conversations on this very important topic. Um, so I did prepare a slide. Um, I don't know if um, Ashley can share that. If not, I can just go ahead and get started just because, um, you know, time. <laughs> All right, so. Um, no, but if you wanna go ahead and get started, I'll, I'll uh, fast forward to where you need him to. Yeah, sure. Um, so just picking back on what uh, Lara was saying um, at the very beginning, um, that there are, you know, these critiques, right, that MMT is basically irrelevant um, for developing countries. And of course, this not just came from the much more hostile uh, mainstream economists, but actually also from some very skeptical, you know, heterodox or progressive economists. Um, so. I have two quotes to share. Um, one is from, um, you know, Jared Epstein, um, who basically wrote in 2019 um, that even though MMT advocates claim that its macroeconomic framework work applies to all countries with sovereign currencies, there is significant evidence that it does not apply to the vast majority of such countries in the developing world that are integrated into global financial markets. Um, end of the quote. Um, and another one that is from the real world economics uh, by Bonizi and um, his associates, who also argue, quote, uh, we argue that MMT proposals fall short of providing a basis for effective development policy and that a broader conceptualization of development strategy is required. Um, jump to the end of the quote, um, MMT adds little to the well-established uh, established heterodox and structuralist development economics literature, um, end of quote. Um, so again, you know, the, these two um, are pretty common critiques, I would say, um, from even the heterodox friendly community. Um, so what I would like to do is to really point out, right, the sort of obvious, right? So get first a basic understanding of what MMT is about, and then let's see the relevance of MMT, right? And how it contributes to our understanding of development, um, the nature of it, and also the process of it. Um, so given the specific audience here, I don't think I'm gonna go through, you know, what MMT is about, right? I think um, most of, if not all of you, right, have that basic um, framework, right? Um, but just suffice it to say that um, MMT is a factual description, right, of how monetary and fiscal operations work, right, in the monetary sovereign country. Um, so there are many different policy implications that can be derived, right, from that description. Um, but in and of itself, right, we, we can't basically just say, you know, MMT doesn't work, right? It is working, right? This is just a description of what it's being um, operated, right? That's what's being done. Um, so I think there is some misconception as to, you know, MMT simply prescribes policies that don't necessarily work um, in certain circumstances, okay? Um, but I'm gonna just go ahead and jump into the point. Um, I, I made this presentation earlier at an AFET meeting and I know that takes more than seven minutes. So uh, I'm gonna try to just, you know, skip some of the basics and get to the 
sort of core. Um, so the first contribution, what I would say is really to um, going back to this very fundamental question, right? What is preventing developing countries from um, develop, uh, from being developed, right? So Jan Kregel wrote in 2004, right? That there were basically this view, uh, two different views, right? The two obstacles um, to development view, right? One says that developing countries is fundamentally challenged, right? By this financing constraint, which is, um, you know, capsulated in this very uh, infamous, I would say, the so-called two gaps model, right? The saving gap and the foreign exchange gap. So um, developing countries just can't develop because they don't have enough savings, right? To finance their investment uh, and growth, and they don't have enough foreign exchange. So then they are not able to, you know, purchase the necessary imports. And so, um, or, you know, attract enough foreign capitals to, to invest. So the sole aim of development policy is reduced to basically introduction to the introduction and implementation of policies that will improve um, domestic mobilization of resources. And here resources specifically means the monetary resources, right, or savings, um, and to provide a hospitable domestic environment to attract the source of foreign investors, right? So that is very sort of contradictory to what MMT uh, would offer, right? What MMT um, allowed us to understand is that financing on credit can be created, right? And it could be created both at the state level where the government spends money into existence, or it can be provide, uh, created at the private banking le uh, level, right? The private borrow the money into in, uh, existence. Um, so in other words, we're, what we really need at, at, you know, for development, right? Is financing and credit, right? And that, be, that can be created, right? Saving um, comes after, right? Saving is a result of investment, income growth, and part of that income gets saved. So I think it's a it's a very important insight, right, to understand what um, what needs to happen, right, before income can be generated and saving can be created. And more importantly, it also shows that the government, the sovereign, the monetary sovereign government, can make sure, right, that the public and private money uh, always they trade at par and um, they can be created, right, the public and private monies. So um, development finance has been and should be primarily domestic. Um, so I have a chart here that basically shows the net resources transfer from developing countries to developed countries. Um, so basically the um, net resource transfer from the developing world to the developed world peaked in 2012 at about, um, let's see here, this is 1 trillion, um, uh, sorry, 10 trillion uh, was the net resources transfer. And 2017 is the last year that I have the data, and that shows um, 500 billion. So in other words, this whole idea that we can somehow, as a developing world, attract foreign capital, right, to finance investment domestically is simply a mirage. It doesn't happen. It has not happened, and it will not happen um, in the future, right? Um, the developing world is actually sending net resources, um, net financial flows to the developed world. So what is really constraining development is the real um, constraints. And again, that's the MMT's teaching, right? So as uh, Professor Kabul have done many work on this, right, is the lack of real resources, the lack of food and energy security and sovereignty and the lack of technological independence. That's what prevent developing countries from rising up. Um, and as Craig also argued, the most underutilized resources in the developing world is the human labor, is the workers, right? So again, I have a chart that shows um, the informal employment um, as a share of the total employment in the developing world, right? And so that is very pronounced in the low income countries. So many workers don't get work or they're performing very low productivity um, kind of work, right? So all these human resources, all these human workers can be mobilized, right? And to, um, you know, produce more food, right? Produce more energy, right? To innovate, to, um, um, to produce, right? So all these are underutilized resources that developing countries have vast, you know, wealth of, okay? Um, so this, again, uh, paved the way, right, to this idea that we need to have the job guarantee by the federal government so that we can put resources in use and improve uh, food and energy sovereignty and security, right? So one thing I think um, when many people look at MMT's prescription, they always think about, well, this 
is just give me inside boost, right? Let's, um, you know, sort of following the function of finance, this idea that we can use tax and government spending to somehow adjust aggregate demand. And so that could help us to achieve, you know, full employment. But I think MMT goes far beyond this, right? There's this idea that, you know, these um, uh, government policies, spendings and financing could also provide supply side or if you will, structural transformations, right? So like the public investment infrastructure, renewable energies, education, health and care, state funding for science, technology and emerging technologies and so on and so forth, okay? Um, so the second contribution in my view is it helped us to really um, pay more attention, right? To bring the public attention to the importance of public space, right? And I think that's a very important point as people jumped out to say, you know, MMT can't work because these uh, developing countries don't have monetary sovereignty. Well, I think that is exactly the point, right? The point is we need to debate and discuss how to reclaim their monetary sovereignty, right? Um, so, there has been some, you know, development in, in sort of in this front, right? This idea of there is a spectrum of monetary sovereignty. So monetary sovereignty is not something, you know, sort of pre-given, right? It's not something endowed, right? It's something that development countries have to earn, right? So this is one thing that I think it's important that we understand, um, you know, having fixed exchange rates, having liberalized capital account, or um, having, you know, um, uh, tied your currency to other currencies and so on and so forth, would not only present the so-called trilemma, right, which is what the mainstream would say, you can't have all three at the same time, fixed exchange rate, free capital flows, and monetary sovereignty. But I think what we really realize here is we are also losing that fiscal um, sovereignty, right, that fiscal autonomy um, when we have fixed exchange rate and free capital flows. So it's actually really a quadrilemma, right? So we need to debate about, you know, what policies should be put in place so we can re-earn and regain and strengthen that monetary sovereignty. Um, and I also agree with my colleague, again, uh, Fadal here, who I think uh, talked about, it's not by a simple declaration that we're gonna have flexible exchange rate, right? And it's not a simple declaration that we're now starting today that we're gonna stop borrowing in foreign currency, right? Um, none of this is realistic, right? But we need to first solve the stock problem, which is the debt overhand that is really worsened by the COVID pandemic. Um, I have some data here that shows um, for the developing world, um, um, they are owing now $11 trillion in external debt and about $3.9 trillion in debt service due in 2020. And worse still, the debt, repay, the debt payment increased by 120% between 20, 2010 and 2021, right? And the average government external debt payment represents about 14% of government's revenues. Um, and that more than doubled um, that, uh, than the 6.8% recorded in 2010. So in other words, um, all these remaining, the debt stock, right, it's really putting developing countries in a very vulnerable position. Um, the governments are asked to tighten the belt, right, even during COVID years, in order to come up with the foreign debt payments. Right. So I think to solve these stock problems, I know um, some of the fellow panelists will talk about later, but I think restructuring debt, right, to reduce the net present value of the debt and also straight, um, you know, debt cancellation by all credits, not just the governmental level, right, without string attached um, are, ne are needed to really solve this sort of the stock problem, right. But going to the long run, right, in terms of the management of, you know, capital flows and debt, um, I would argue um, capital control or sovereign capital structure management um, in quotation marks. And this is from Michael Petit, right? We need to revisit, you know, he's writing back in 2001, the volatility to machine that talks about how we need to, um, if we do need to borrow, right? Some of the borrowing might be inevitable in the short run, right? Then we need to make sure that we have a balance sheet management of the balance of payments, right? The, the, the idea that we need to have the funding correlated with your income and avoid mismatches with maturity and, and, and sort of currencies. And I'm happy to elaborate more or um, wait for others to address that point. Um, also industrial policies, trade regulations, regional trade and payment systems, international or regional development-based funding sources are some of the remedies, right? To um, really manage that external payments and external balance um, over the long haul. Uh, my third contribution here uh, how am I doing in terms of time, uh, Lara? Uh, 
you should try and wrap up in maybe okay. one minute. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I like to go in deficit, but maybe not in this occasion. Um, so the third contribution here is, you know, the, the idea um, that development finance needs to be, um, you know, again, uh, sort of have a, the state, right, needs to play a much stronger role in providing development finance. And here, I think the policy banks um, would play a very important role. And I have different um, sort of um, examples here, but I'm going to sort of uh, skip that for now. But tankers, uh, Griffiths, Jones, and O'Campbell um, have written about this in 2018, right, to sort of uh, re-emphasize the role of development policy banks in the developing world. And I have a paper, I mean, book chapter forthcoming, and I also um, show how the Chinese, right, um, is, is able to utilize development banks um, to advance is, you know, technology and other development long-term planning and so on. Um, and then my last point really is um, the last contribution of MMT for us to understand um, you know, how fiscal spending um, and public debt actually help to build the um, strength, right, of the private sector's balance. Um, so fiscal spending is helping with aggregate profits and public debt is basically the source of private wealth. So again, I think in the MMT community, we all understand this. And I think that's even more important when it comes to developing countries where, you know, they have still very fledging, you know, financial system, um, the households and corporations are, you know, always prone to taking on credit and debt to support the necessary spending and so on. So I think it's very important um, to increase public spending and public debt, um, you know, not to mention the job guarantee program um, in order to generate private health and stabilize private sectors balance sheets, right, their financial orders. Um, so those are the four contributions and I will um, stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Karina, are your technical issues solved? Uh, I hope so. Okay, so hopefully it's going to work out. Our next speaker is uh, Karina Patricia Ferreira. She's a lecturer in commercial law at the University of Leeds School of Law in the UK. And she will pick up more on the debt point that you mentioned and talk about it in the context of the current global financial system, which is what came out of the Bread and Woods Conference at the end of World War II, and pretty much not a lot has changed since in that system. So, uh, Karina, looking forward to you telling us how, what that system means for countries in terms of, you know, debt and debt cycles. Thank you, Lara. Um, First of all, uh, it's a pleasure for me to participate in this panel, and I would like to thank the organizers for putting together such an interesting conference, and I look forward to he learning from you all. Uh, I, my presentation today, uh, I, I prepared some slides. I'm not sure uh, this, it's possible to share them, but otherwise I'll just speak. It's fine, because uh, they have some graphs, but I don't know. Yeah. We're trying um, to pull them up now, um, and we'll fast forward to the point where you're at if, if we're able to get them up. Um, apologies for the technical difficulties. Okay, great, no problem. So I'll focus on three main parts. Uh, so first I'll uh, speak about how the post Bretton Woods system is structurally broken and the systematic causes of sovereign debt prices in the monetary periphery. Then I'll discuss how the IMF is a part of this picture uh, by placing the cost of adjustment on constituencies uh, in the monetary periphery, facing balance of payments problems, and, and then I'll connect those issues with my most recent work uh, by discussing the legality of IMF lending that is inevitably set to deteriorate a country's balance of payments. Uh, and this is the case of the 2018 standby arrangement with Argentina. Uh, I have um, a summary, so if you could go just next slide, please. Uh, yeah, um, that's a summary, and then please the next one. So the post Bretton Wood system is a broken system, and it's structurally organized to increase the development gap between the global south and the global north. Uh, in my view, this is due to three fundamental reasons. So first we have uh, monetary hierarchies, right? Uh, the international monetary system comprises a wide range 
of domestic currencies with asymmetric powers to function as international money. And only the US dollar and a few core currencies, but especially the US dollar, performs the functions of money at an international level, um, meaning it works as a global unit of account, means of payment, in cross-border transactions and store of value, in this case, as an international reserve currency. So, um, of course, money that performs the function of money at an international level is highly sought after because it provides um, security in the face of economic uncertainty. We have monetary hierarchies, right? So only the US dollar performs the, the function of money at an international level, fully performs. This is... Um, in, and this grants the United States an exorbitant privilege um, in terms of running macroeconomic policies without balance of payments constraints. Um, and uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so you can, as you can see in this graph, we have 60% of global foreign uh, exchange reserves held in US dollars, and most of the remaining in core currencies, such as the euro, the pound, the yen, and a small proportion in renminbi among other currencies. And the next slide, um, you will see in the other graph on the currency denomination of foreign exchange reserves, foreign debt, uh, foreign exchange turnover and global payments. And this is what I mean by performing the function of money at an international level. So that's a key issue, right? Uh, monetary hierarchies. Let, now let's move on to current, uh, to capital account openness, uh, which is the next line, um, we have, well, an international monetary system where currencies have this asymmetric level of liquidity can only get even more problematic for the monetary periphery when the whole system is structured on the basis of in unrestricted cap capital movements, right? And why is that? Because global liquidity cycles have an opposite direction in the core as opposed to the periphery. So when a credit cycle begins to turn down, downward or core central banks adopt monetary tightening policy, such as in the current moment, uh, peripheral currency states are more vulnerable to withdrawals from contracts denominated in their currency. So particularly financial contracts. And this risks significant and sudden current, cur um, currency depreciations uh, in the periphery for reasons that uh, are beyond the soundness of its fiscal policy, as orthodox theory suggests. And this causes systemic sovereign debt crisis in the monetary periphery. Uh, so as you can see on the slide, there is a gradual liberalization of capital flows triggered by the collapse of Bretton Woods, and this has occasioned a significant rise in sovereign debt crisis. Um, and in, in over the last 200 years, um, there were more than 260 sovereign default episodes, uh, and nearly 120 of those uh, happened during the last 30 years. Uh, in, in relation to capital account openers, of course, I must stress here that, uh, well, even though the IMF has no legal mandate over the capital account, it did seek to reform its mandate in the 1990s to liberalize the capital account. It did not succeed in doing so. And following the global financial crisis and more recently in the past weeks, the IMF has recognized that under certain circumstances, it's adequate to regulate cross-border movements of capital. But these are either exceptional circumstances or precautionary inflows management, and they do not include precautionary outflows management, which uh, here it would be important to prevent sovereign debt crisis. Uh, so this is a crucial issue. And let me just move uh, quickly to asymmetric access to liquidity, which is the next slide. We have those, uh, well, finally, the, the underlying vulnerabilities that we are mentioning here, monetary hierarchies and, um, and capital account openness are intensified by the present techniques used to manage global liquidity cycles. Right, because ultimately, when the credit cycle turns downward, the most powerful central banks predominantly backstop currencies higher in the monetary hierarchy. So the US dollar's key role in the global financial system places the, U the Federal Reserve as the world's top central bank. And in the current system, the backstops uh, provided by the Fed Federal Reserve generally take the form of currency swaps that make US dollars uh, available, uh, readily available, but only to core central banks. Um, the C, what Merlin denominates as the C, the C6, right? 
Um, so the UK, the Eurozone, Switzerland, Japan, Canada. Uh, and there are some limited exceptions, uh, especially during the global financial crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic to certain periphery central banks, but these are only exceptions and they are limited. And the lower ranking peripheral currencies are not backstop in this way. And so they are likely to find investors and international users fleeing to the stability of currencies that do not that, that do have that, that do have such a backstop. Um, so this only exacerbates the core periphery dynamics of the international monetary system, right? Because the monetary periphery, by contrast, must either seek to roll over existing debts at higher interest rates or uh, draw on their own reserves, or if none of those uh, are not uh, possible, then they'll have to turn to the IMF, uh, which has uh, tended to condition such support on contractionary policies, uh, which I'll briefly discuss in a minute. Um, so if you just move to the next slide, you'll see that to offset this trend of volatility, central banks in emerging and developing countries have been holding more dollar reserves so that they can intervene in foreign exchange markets rather than go to the IMF, right? So most of the uh, most of total foreign currency reserves are held by uh, emerging and developing countries, but this comes at a huge opportunity cost, uh, especially um, in in emerging countries because they are um, they are compelled to hold those reserves, uh, accumulating a massive amount of reserves, uh, and they are unable to use them for productive purposes, right? Uh, especially, let's, for example, development policies, financing the green transition, and so on. Uh, and also, well, finally, we have countries that lack self-insurance, and they are exposed to sudden stops because of large amounts of capital um, received. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and this is the case of Argentina, to which, I, which I'll discuss in a minute. Uh, so if, let's just move on to the next slide very quickly. So in this here, I would just like to stress that the role of the IMF is systemic in the post Bretton Woods um, system, because um, here basically uh, we, we saw that the IMF here in terms of access to liquidity acts as the lender of less resort of the monetary periphery. But the main problem with that is that in doing so, the IMF is designed to place the cost of adjustment on constituencies in the monetary periphery uh, facing balance of payments problems. And how do they do this? Basically, it's through its conditionality policy, which is typically recessionary, produces wealth concentrating effects both within the country and across nations. Uh, the most typical conditionalities, I'm quite sure the audience will be familiar with them, uh, especially fiscal adjustment, but also tax increases, especially VIT, monetary policy reforms, prioritizations, labor and security reforms, among others. Um, and um, here, uh, I argue that in the post Bretton Woods era, conditionality has become a legal mechanism of risk reallocation, where the IMF de-risks its own uh, general resources, but at, at, at the expense of recessionary adjustments in the periphery. And this is, uh, I see this as uh, strongly linked with the scarcity of IMF resources vis-a-vis -vis global liquidity in general. And this is also linked with the governance of the fund, right, right? Where there is a complete mismatch between those who control the quotas and those who actually use the resources. Um, and uh, I think that basically to correct those imbalances uh, we should do two things we must rethink what debt sustainability means how to achieve debt sustainability and also seriously rethink the international monetary system to ensure that the burden of adjustment is not entirely placed onto jurisdictions facing balance of payments problems this is not new as uh, some of you will be familiar with Keynes has already thought about this and the international clear union is a way to achieve this purpose. Uh, I won't elaborate too much on that for time constraints, due to time constraints, uh, but I'm happy to discuss that uh, later. Uh, so let's move on just to the next uh, slide, please. Um, just some brief words on the legal issues posed by the IMF's lending practices in the post Bretton Woods period, uh, where we have the situation of capital account openers and hyper financialization and how and, and they, they have resulted in increasingly significant financial crisis. 
Um, and uh, from a legal standpoint, the problem with that practice that the IMF adopts in this case of uh, it has become an international lender of last resort, um, providing increasingly significant exceptional access financing, often on the basis of weak macroeconomic assumptions, highly politicized criteria. And I think from a legal standpoint, the problem here is that uh, with that practice is particularly acute when the IMF engages in lending that is inevitably set to deteriorate a country's balance of payments, such as the standby arrangement with Argentina in 2018. Um, and uh, I won't get into too much detail for due to time. Um, I'm just cautious about the time. Uh, but uh, basically here we are, we, we argue, I, I wrote a paper on this together with Chris Marsh, uh, and uh, we argue that the, this standby arrangement violated the core purposes of the IMF um, as per the Articles of Agreement of the IMF, and therefore it constitutes an ultra-virus act, uh, which means that uh, it's an act where they have overstepped their own legal mandate. And um, when international organizations act beyond their legal capacity, uh, any substantive acts that overstep the powers of international organizations are legally uh, void or voidable under international law. And uh, basically, we argue that the fund has acted ultra virus due to two main substantive reasons, the lack of adequate safeguards and the lack of uh, capital management requirements. Uh, and we argue that uh, given the absence of a review body in the IMF or any accountability mechanism whatsoever within the IMF, uh, It looks like we might have lost Karina again. Um, if she's not here now, maybe she can come back afterwards. Um, it looks like she just dropped out. Um, so hopefully, hopefully she'll come back in. But uh, she, yeah, she just dropped out of the conference. Okay, so maybe let's just go on to our next speaker and then hopefully, she, you know, she can come back and wrap up afterwards. Um, our next speaker, I don't see his camera, but uh, Ndongo, are you here? Or, oh, Karina, are you back? It looks like he's back too. Um, I'm not sure. So let's until we figure this out if Karina is not back yet. Um, um, Dongoyo Sambasila is our next speaker. He is joining us from Senegal, uh, where he is a research and program manager at uh, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. And I am actually very excited to hear your presentation because it's another aspect of this current system that people don't pay as much attention to and don't realize the implication and the rise in the use of sanctions from the main monetary powers and the effects it has. So looking forward to you telling us from the developing country perspective, you know, how can countries respond to, to sections and deal with that? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I would like uh, to start first by thanking the Modern Money Network for inviting me to attend this excellent gathering. I also extend my greetings to my co-panelists. Um, as you said, my presentation uh, is titled um, Surviving Economic Sanctions, Why Formal Monetary Sovereignty Matters. And I will try briefly to have a conversation with the way uh, monetary sovereignty uh, is defined in the MMT literature and uh, a definition I, uh, I agree with. Uh, because in the MMT literature, you find, find this idea that uh, <clears throat> monetary sovereignty is the ability of the sovereign uh, to pay in its own currency without any intrinsic financial constraint. And you would find also in the literature this idea of a spectrum of uh, monetary sovereignty. And I think that the young young uh, uh, spoke about that. 
And this ID is very important of a spectrum uh, because it's a way of uh, acknowledging the fact that not all governments are monetary sovereign and that uh, there are also significant differences between uh, non-sovereign currencies, uh, for example. In this talk, I want to stress uh, why what I call formal or nominal monetary sovereignty matters. Uh, by formal or nominal monetary sovereignty, I mean the fact uh, for a government to have unconstrained access to its domestic financial system, unconstrained access to its domestic financial system. In principle, all governments that issue a national currency, a non-dollarized currency, have formal sovereignty. Uh, formal sovereignty or nominal monetary sovereignty is a prerequisite uh, for monetary sovereignty as it is defined by MMT. Uh, as I will show, uh, formal or nominal sovereignty is very critical for governments facing economic and financial sanctions, whatever the rank they occupy in the spectrum of monetary sovereignty. And to make the case for the theoretical and political significance of monetary, formal monetary sovereignty, that means having a national currency, I will elaborate briefly on the contrasting cases of two West African countries, Guinea and Mali. I know that we are more and more uh, currently talking about uh, sanctions against Russia, but there are also other African countries which are under sanctions from their, let's say, their neighbors, but also uh, from, let's say, Western countries. And uh, Guinea and Mali are two examples of uh, African countries facing sanctions. So I will um, make a brief history of, of Guinea and Mali so as to make you uh, understand what is uh, currently going on. Uh, Guinea got its independence in 1958, uh, two years before, let's say, the other uh, f uh, colonies of France uh, south of the Sahara. And when Guinea uh, obtained its independence uh, by referendum, uh, it decided two years ago to uh, have its own national currency and to exit the, the, the front zone. The front zone was a monetary and trade zone dominated by, by, by France and yeah, using the French franc as a nominal anchor. And when uh, the uh, Guinean government uh, led by uh, a trade unionist uh, secretary decided to um, launch its national currency, uh, he was faced with reprisals. And um, uh, the reprisals take the form of economic sabotage because the French secret services uh, decided to flood the Guinean economy with uh, counterfeit banknotes so as uh, to, to, to disrupt the whole uh, Guinean economy. And it was also a way of saying to other countries, well, if you want to have monetary sovereignty, you will have to pay it uh, dearly. And um, this was in 1960. Uh, two years later, in 1962, uh, Mali was also under the government of a progressive leader, a socialist leader called Modibo Keita. And Modibo Keita realized that well, when you stay in the front zone, uh, that means a kind of a colonial uh, monetary system, uh, you could not have development for your country. It's impossible to have the, the adequate financing structures, the adequate macroeconomic framework for, for development. So he decided to leave uh, the, the, the front zone, the CFA zone. And what happened was that um, the neighboring countries, Senegal and Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal is my country, they decided, let's say, to put, let's say, trade barriers against Mali, which is a landlocked country, in a way to put pressure on Mali and also send a signal to other countries to stay, tell them that, well, uh, you have to say <laughs> it's within the front zone. So, uh, but, well, Guinea stayed with national currency for five years. And after that, well, <clears throat> uh, Modi Boketa was removed from power and uh, they rejoined the, the front zone with, let's say, a national so-called national currency, but a currency that was administered jointly by Mali and the Bank of France, by the French Treasury. And it's only in 1984 that Mali joined the West African Economic, uh, West African Monetary Union form formally. And since then, uh, Mali uh, is part of the eight countries using the CFA franc in West Africa. So briefly, the CFA franc was a, a, a currency created in 1945, uh, just after the Second World War. Uh, and it is still circulating in eight countries in West Africa, six in Central Africa. And it uh, functions uh, based on four pillars. The first is the fixed peg to the, to the French currency. Before it was a French franc, 
and since 1999 is the euro so the cfa franc is uh, pegged to the euro the second pillar is that well there is this principle of uh, let's say free uh, mobility of capital and free transfer policy that means basically that uh, well all the um, uh, french capitals and uh, incomes could be uh, transferred easily uh, from the France zone countries to let's say uh, to paris uh, the third principle is the, what is so called uh, uh, the french convertibility guarantee this means that while well, the french treasury and not the bank of france uh, accepts the principle to um, grant an overdraft to the to the central bank let's say of west africa and its counterpart in central africa so that whenever they are devoid of uh, foreign exchange the uh, french treasury and not the bank of france will uh, will step in to to lend the desired amount of foreign exchange in the french currency this is the so-called uh convertibility guarantee and this so-called convertibility guarantee which has practically never been activated only let's say between 1980s and 1999s to allow for let's say uh, capital flight um there are two counterparts the first is that the french uh government is represented in the organs of the central bank so uh before it has a veto right <clears throat> but after this veto right has been camouflaged in the in the statutes but all major decisions statutory decisions has to be have to be made with the consent of the french uh, representatives the second counterpart to this so-called uh, uh, convertibility guarantee is that the BCA war, uh, that means the Central Bank of West Africa and its counterpart in Central Africa, they are obliged to deposit, let's say, 50% uh, of their foreign exchange reserves in the French uh, in the account at the French Treasury. And uh, so that means that, well, uh, if they accumulate foreign exchange, they are legally obliged to, if, if for example, if they have US dollars, they have to convert it into euros so that every time they have at least 50% of their foreign exchange uh, at the French Treasury. Uh, recently, they made a change because, well, uh, before there was a remuneration of 0.75% for these foreign exchange reserves, but now with the <coughs> low rates, uh, the French decided to, uh, let's say, to close that. Uh, to close that account and the money now is used to, by the central bank to buy let's say um sovereign debt in euros 100 percent in euro at a rate for example of 0 0.6 for uh, five years uh, maturity so the point is that well uh these countries could not take any decision uh, regarding monetary and exchange rate policy without the consent of the french treasury that's why uh mali is in a very special situation as a member of this colonial currency system. So what happened with that, uh, Mali, uh, well, has been, uh, <clears throat> uh, let's say, a victim of uh, what happened in Libya. When there was this uh, uh, invasion of Libya by NATO, um, the weapons dropped there were used by, uh, let's say, terrorists to invade the northern Mali. And uh, France intervened to stop. In fact, that was a... Uh, uh, the motive for the intervention to stop the so-called uh, uh, jihadists there. But uh, the military interventions from France were not that successful because there were many casualties, uh, civil casualties, military casualties, etc. And uh, there was a context of frustration and uh, the military came to power. And uh, well, most people were happy with that, surprisingly, not because they want uh, to have military rule, but in fact, they were uh, hoping that a change would come. And uh, in the West Africa, there's an organization called Economic Community of West African States. And uh, they have a charter of uh, good governance and democracy. And they do not tolerate, let's say, a coup d'etat. And so uh, sanctions were taken uh, against Mali but also against Guinea because there was also a coup d'etat in Guinea. But what is interesting is that uh, there have been a number of, of sanctions. Uh, for example, the assets of, let's say, the, the uh, personalities and officials of Mali and Guinea were frozen first time. And after they uh, put more pressure by, let's say, uh, closing the borders between Mali, which is a landlocked country, and other neighboring countries in West Africa. And there was also uh, in the sanctions a uh, measure of extreme gravity 
uh, because it was an attack uh, on the financial and poetic sovereignty of the Republic of Mali. Uh, they decided, in fact, to freeze, uh, that's what they uh, said in their communique, uh, they, to freeze the assets in the central and commercial banks of ECOWAS. ECOWAS is the economic community of West African states, so it gathers uh, 15 countries, and eight of them uh, belong to the safer zone in, in West Africa. But most people uh, well, uh, would not uh, see the significance of these sanctions in the case of Mali and the difference you, you could have between Mali and Guinea because they just saw that, well, it was a kind of um, normal, uh, the type of sanctions we used to see, for example, uh, a Western government decided to freeze the assets of Mali or to, to freeze the assets of Afghanistan or Iran, etc. So in this case, it was said that, well, all the assets in the central banks and in the commercial banks were frozen. So in the case of Mali, that meant that uh, Mali did no longer uh, uh, have access to its own central bank. The central bank, it shares with the other countries of the, let's say, West African Monetary Union. And uh, what was interesting when you, uh, uh, from a, let's say, a monetary sovereignty perspective, is that well, um, the ECOWAS, Economic Community of West African States, they could sanction both Mali and Guinea by, let's say, uh, freezing their external assets, external financial assets. But in no case, they could uh, divorce uh, the Ghanaian government from its own central bank, from its own, let's say, domestic financial system. But in the case of Mali, they were successful. They could do that. Why? Because Mali, uh, in contrast to Guinea, uh, is not a sovereign currency issuer. Mali is a member of, uh, let's say, a monetary union, a monetary union which has, let's say, some colonial aspects. And so this was really uh, interesting as an experiment because it shows that, well, <clears throat> there are limits to the kind of sanctions, economic and financial sanctions, you could face as a nation. Uh, Guinea has its own currency. Uh, maybe the currency is not so strong, it depreciates regularly, but at least uh, no external power could divorce the Guinean government from its central bank, from its domestic financial system. While for Mali, this was possible. And this was possible because also uh, the law has not been respected because all the economic and financial sanctions were illegal, whatever uh, might be our opinion regarding the coup d'etat, etc. But there were no legal basis for these sanctions. And if you, um, if there is something called uh, a convention for, let's say, landlord countries, and normally you should not put in a trade embargo countries which are landlocked and which do not have access to the to the sea. Uh, but in the case of Mali, uh, the African governments were ready to implement any kind of sanctions, even if they are, they have no economic rationality. For example, in the case of my country, Senegal, uh, Mali is our first trade partner. That means that uh, uh, in terms of value, uh, we buy 10th more uh, from Mali. Uh, Mali buys 10th more from us, for, from us than um, for example, the European Union, the, uh, all the countries of the European Union combined. But nonetheless, they were ready to take these sanctions. Why? Because, in fact, uh, the Malian government uh, has an issue with the French government because the Malian government wanted to end the French military uh, operation because the French military operation did not allow them to have, a, for example, a coordination between their <clears throat> actions on the ground and on the air. Even if Mali was a sovereign can is a sovereign country and considered a democracy, uh, for any uh, aerial intervention, Mali has to have, let's say, the consent of the French military before any operation. You see, and this uh, was a kind of information we knew uh, following the the coup d'état, and so the French government uh, wants to get rid of uh, this, um, this 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 military government. And that's why they put pressure on, let's say, the, the other countries and also the central bank. Normally, the central bank is supposed to be independent from the states. And normally, normally it should not take any, let's say, uh, <clears throat> any recommendation or any direct uh, policy from uh, the, the, the states. But in this case, uh, the sanctions came from the ECOWAS. That means an entity external to the, to, to, to the monetary union. And uh, it, it is also clearly said in the 
a treaty uh, of this uh, currency union that uh, is anything that uh, let's say uh, is um, uh, hampering the free flow of monetary science of the free payments between members is illegal and any member that uh, uh, do things like that uh, should be removed from the from, from the monetary union <clears throat> but that means that well they were ready to implement those sanctions and this type of sanctions have been also done previously in, in Cote d'Ivoire in 2011 because at that time there was an electoral let's say dispute and uh, France sided with one candidate and to put pressure on the other candidate while well, a kind of a financial embargo was organized using the, the same mechanism that means uh, uh, denying access uh, denying the government ever given access to its own accounts at the central bank and also no way, no no possibility to use its uh, foreign exchange and and so on and what is also very uh, <laughs> unusual is that uh, uh, even the central bank uh, was complicit in the making uh, the Malian government default on its debt in foreign currency in 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 in, uh, in foreign currency but also in the domestic currency normally um, there are uh, mechanisms uh, that render this situation unlikely to say impossible uh, but now uh, this year uh, after some calculation i did uh, the malian government will uh, default on at least um, uh, uh, 3 uh, 100 uh, billion uh, cfa franc in in, bond, in treasury bonds and and bills and this has been uh, let's say a decision uh, let's say taken uh, by the by the central bank because this could have been avoid it so my, my point here with these two uh, contrasting examples was to say just that well there are limits to how uh, far economic sanctions can go uh, the countries that are most vulnerable to economic and financial sanctions are countries that have no uh, monetary sovereignty at all that means countries that do not issue their own currency so uh, even if uh, Guinea does not have let's say monetary sovereignty in an MMT sense it has at least more leeway uh, compared, for example, uh, to, to, to Mali, which uh, has no sovereignty at all and who is very weak uh, currently. Uh, so with this example also, we find the familiar observation that issuing a national currency is a prerequisite for financial sovereignty and ultimately political sovereignty. Thank you very much. Lara, we, we can't hear you. I think you're either on mute or we lost your connection. It's, I don't think we can hear you, but it's okay. I can go ahead in the interest of time um, until we figure out the technical issue on your side. Uh, my name is Fadel Kaboub. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, I'd like to uh, kind of build on what my uh, colleagues have uh, have already presented. So I'd like to thank my colleagues and, and the Modern Money Network for this uh, wonderful event. I'll try to keep this short. So I'll start by re-emphasizing one of the points that um, almost everybody on the panel made, which is from an MMT perspective, we think of countries uh, within the spectrum of monetary sovereignty, where on one end we have countries with high degrees of monetary sovereignty, countries on the opposite end of the spectrum with very limited or even no monetary sovereignty whatsoever. This is the case of countries that completely dollarize their economy and don't have a national currency, CFA uh, countries in, in particular, and countries in between who have a very limited degree of monetary sovereignty. And what that degree of monetary sovereignty gives you as a country is the capacity to spend a deficit spend um, and address national priorities without having to face the consequences of major uh, risks to your external balance, major inflation risk, major de de depreciation, currency depreciation risks. And as, uh, as Yen uh, argued earlier, the um, degree of monetary sovereignty is not something that you decree uh, or declare as a country. It's something that you actually earn and acquire through strategic investments that build the economic capacity, the productive capacity, the resilience, so that you can acquire higher and higher degrees of monetary sovereignty. So my, 
my research interests are, are typically focused on what are those strategic investments that allow a country to uh, claim higher and higher degrees of monetary sovereignty as a result, build more resilience to these external shocks without facing the risk of inflation. So in a, in a single country framework, you can think of you know, what determines that high degree of monetary sovereignty is not just the capacity to issue your own currency and tax the population in your own currency. Those are kind of given. Most countries have that option. It's really the, the third and fourth condition that I want to highlight here, which is number one, not having to borrow in foreign currencies and as a result, accumulate external debt. And here we distinguish between debt denominated in the national currency, that's internal public debt, versus debt denominated in foreign currencies. And that's really what weakens uh, your degree of monetary sovereignty. And related to that, it's the issue of fixing the exchange rate or allowing the exchange rate to be more flexible. Again, it's not something that you declare by decree and, and say, we want to have a fixed exchange rate or a flexible exchange rate. It's something that you acquire. A flexible exchange rate is can, can work really well if you have the economic strength and resilience uh, to, um, to, to govern a system economically without facing major currency depreciations and so on. So in that context, the, the issue of capital controls obviously is, is very important in, in building that, that resilience. So that's kind of a, a point of definition that I wanted to make sure we, we all have in front of us. And then what I want to look at is what are the major challenges that we face uh, globally? We have climate change, we have so many issues related to public health, lack of investment, which we've discovered very painfully during the COVID crisis uh, in many parts of the world. So all of these require massive investments to decarbonize the system, to build resilience and so on. So we're told from a mainstream perspective that fiscal spending, the fiscal policy space is just not there. So developing countries can't do it unless you grow your economy uh, via export oriented growth or foreign direct investment growth or tourism. And what I've argued in my work is that all of those typical policy uh, solutions that are often advocated by the World Bank, the IMF, the kind of WTO type of uh, organizations, they're actually structural traps. Uh, even the so-called structural adjustment program it's anything but structural. If anything, it's designed to deepen and strengthen the, the structural traps, the neocolonial traps that many countries in the global south suffer from. So um, if, you, if you put countries on that spectrum, what you discover very quickly is that the countries with the highest degree of monetary sovereignty, like the US, uh, Japan, the UK, Australia, Canada, and so on, it's countries in the global north. Countries on the other end of the spectrum are typically the global South countries. So that's observation number one. Observation number two, when you look at who's been most responsible for uh, climate damage since the Industrial Revolution, it almost matches perfectly on that spectrum. Countries on the higher end of the spectrum, uh, the global North has been responsible for climate change. Uh, countries that have not been responsible but suffer the most, the conse consequences of climate change are typically on the uh, weaker end of the monetary spectrum, monetary sovereignty spectrum, which means very limited capacity, fiscal capacity to actually address climate change. Observation number three, in terms of technological capabilities, research and development capabilities, productive capacity to actually scale up the production and, and deployment of alternative energy sources, renewable energy sources, and build infrastructure of resilience from a, from a technological perspective, it's again countries on the global north who have most of those capabilities, not countries in the global south. And then the last observation, or two more observations, one is the, the colonial and neocolonial extractive economic development model has been moving resources, financial and real resources, and, and brain power resources from the global south to the global north, again on that spectrum of monetary sovereignty. Uh, to, to emphasize a, a point that uh, Yen was uh, making earlier, which is if you, if you net out global financial transactions between two groups, Global South and Global North, we see that we have more than $2 trillion annually moving from the poorest countries in the Global South to the richest countries in the Global North. So just these observations that I laid out here with the spectrum essentially lays the case 
for um, uh, reparations, colonial reparations, neo-colonial reparations, and climate reparations. And reparations as in not just transfer of financial resources from uh, global north to the global south, but it's actually repairing broken structures, repairing the international trade uh, and finance system that sucks those $2 trillion from the poorest countries to the richest countries, repairing the actual uh, physical infrastructure, uh, repairing the international trade system so that developing countries are not constantly trapped uh, in a situation where they have to borrow more dollars in order to sustain uh, a fixed exchange rate in order to build foreign currency reserves in order to continue with the same economic development policies that keep them in those traps, which is heavy reliance on tourism, heavy reliance on low value added manufacturing for exports, heavy reliance on remittances, which fuels uh, brain drain uh, and heavy reliance on export oriented growth and foreign direct investment oriented growth, which uh, forces developing countries to specialize on the lower value added content of the global supply chain. Um, uh, so these are the structural traps that uh, that we've uh, we've been uh, seeing in the global south since the very first uh, days of post-colonial uh, early independence days uh, to this day. So for me, it's uh, if we're really going to tackle all the major global issues, especially climate change. There is no way we're going to do it under the current uh, model. Uh, the global north has the fiscal capacity, uh, has the technological capacity, has the moral and ethical responsibility for repairing the damage. Um, so it's time for us to uh, think about how we're going to do this. So having a, a global climate fund sounds uh, great. Putting $100 billion in it sounds great, even though there's only $8 billion in it right now, 10 years later. Um, but it's not going to put a dent in a system that sucks two trillion dollars on the other side on the other side of the equation. So it's, uh, I mean, for me, it's not even funny. It's it's not even a joke to say that well, we have a system that sucks two trillion. So we're going to fix it by declaring a fund that should have a hundred billion, but only put eight billion in it, and and see how you know eventually we're going to get out of this uh, this crisis. Um, so the last point I want to emphasize, which is the issue of inflation, because uh, a lot of people will say, well, if even if the global north uh, is going to, you know, contribute with financial reparations, with in-kind reparations and, and so on, uh, it's going to create hyperinflation and, and even in the, in the global north. Well, from an MMT perspective, what determines the, the limit of how much a country can spend are two things. Um, related to the potential risk of inflation. The risk of inflation can materialize when you have a lack of productive capacity, that is skilled people, technology, raw materials, and so on. The good news about productive capacity is that it's producible. So we can strategically invest in areas that allow us to build more productive capacity, create millions of, of jobs, and eliminate the potential risk of inflation driven by shortages and supply chain disruptions and so on. So that's the easy part, so to speak, if we just focus on those strategic areas where we need to build capacity. The second source of uh, risk of inflation has to do with abuse of market power. It has to do with the fact that you have key players at the national level, at the global level, who can raise prices and control, administer prices simply because they can uh, or simply because we let them. Uh, meaning antitrust laws that are way outdated and international trading system that's dominated by a handful of gigantic corporations. Think of the global food system literally being controlled by five global corporations. That's what we're talking about, democratizing the economic system uh, at the national level so we can tame those inflation risks so we can actually accelerate the decarbonization and the transformation of economies at the local and global level without hitting the inflation barrier. I happen to believe that it's absolutely within reach, it's possible, but the real obstacles as we've highlighted are the real resource obstacles, the political obstacles, the corruption obstacles, uh, and the cartels and monopolies and international uh, uh, you know, price setting behavior that we see in, in key markets. So with that, uh, uh, I'd love to you know, engage with questions. Uh, I do have a longer version of what I just said. I'm going to. 
I do have a longer version of what I just said. I'm going to put it in the chat. You can look at it later. So thank you. Thank you. And hopefully you can hear me now. Yes. OK, so we saw this. So Karina is back right now. So very quickly in three minutes, if you can just wrap up your presentation and then we'll have 20 more minutes to take some questions and have closing statements from the presenters. Yes. Uh, well, apologies, uh, everyone, for the problems, the technical issues. I was just saying, just to wrap up, really, um, I talked about ultra virus lending and the issues that are uh, that are brought in terms of the IMF's legal mandate in the post Bretton Woods system. I was just saying, in relation to the standby arrangement with Argentina, that there is no uh, review body, either judicial or political, with, within the fund's institutional framework. And so only the International Court of Justice would be able to advise on the legality of the of those arrangements. There is no um, case, uh, no case has ever been brought, uh, no advisory opinion has ever been brought be uh, before the International Court of Justice in relation to the IMF. This would be a, a, a nice way to motorize uh, changes. Um, I believe the case of Argentina should pose a huge red flag and made, make us rethink what we are doing with the general resources of the international community and how the features of the current system are distorting so much the IMF's functioning to the point of engaging in unlawful practices like the standby arrangement. Uh, and yeah, basically just to conclude, I think a reform is urgently needed and I'm thankful to this year's edition of the conference for enabling this debate at the core of such an important community. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we can move on to questions for the panelists. Um, there was one question I saw earlier on, and I, we can start with that one that was from someone who I don't know if they're still here, but does what are the recommended resources on reclaiming monetary sovereignty? Which you know seems like a very big question since we saw all these different angles as like aspects and institutional arrangements that sort of prevent this from happening. So I don't know if you want to share a couple of thoughts or ideas. Um. Um, I can sort of just get it started. Um, so what I think is, again, this is, I. It, it's going to be a multi-dimension, I think, um, sort of, response to that, right? So we definitely need domestic, you know, savvy policies, um, like Fidel was, Fidel was talking about the strategic investments that would help to mobilize domestic resources and, you know, improve food and energy sovereignty um, and technological innovations. And so that would help to, you know, allow countries to not to engage too much in external borrowing and so on. Um, there's also some technical issues, I think the technical management of, um, your balance sheets, right? So your, your balance payments. So that goes to what I think um, Karina, with, Katrina was talking about that um, when you think about, you know, external borrowing, I think it really needs to have a balance in terms of, you know, if, you know, there is the repayment issues, then that bar burden should be equally shared between the creditors and the, the lenders. So things like tight your um, loan size with your, um, you know, foreign revenues, right? So if your certain exports is expected to drop, then that would also correspondingly reduce your debt payments. So there are some ways, um, you know, that we would need to manage the economy that strengthen the economy from within to reduce the sort of borrowing, right? At the, at the proactive level, but then there are also preventative measures that would help to, you know, manage the, um, you know, mismatches, right, in your in your um, assets and your, your liabilities and the different term structures and also currencies. So that's number one. And I think there are also remedies, that, as I mentioned, at the regional level, right? So what I'm thinking is we, many different countries are, um, you know, relying on the World Bank or IMF, but there are other, maybe, you know, the Chinese AARP, maybe some sort of, can be some sort of alternative, right? Um, or the regional level that, you know, swap lines and sort of different arrangements can be made in terms of trade and finance. 
Um, and then finally, at the international level, and again, I agree with the, the cohort, the, the sort of the um, panelists that we need to definitely uh, reform the system, right? Starting from the IMF, uh, World Bank, and many other sort of um, even private sector, the credits, um, the creditors, right? The, the lending system. So, um, so I think, yeah, th this is going to require multiple levels of reforms, and um, so all these things to happen. Uh, I'll just add a, a couple of things on, on what Yen uh, just said in terms of reclaiming a, a higher degree of monetary sovereignty. Uh, when you look at most developing countries and the loss of monetary sovereignty is typically driven by heavy reliance on food imports and energy imports, in addition to other problems, uh, high tech equipment and things like that. But you can't run an economy anywhere in the world without food, without energy. I think this has become more obvious since the uh, conflict in, in the Ukraine for, for most countries in the global south. So you start building your economic and monetary sovereignty by investing primarily uh, and first as a, as a matter of sequenced investment, first in food sovereignty and energy sovereignty, not just food security and energy security. Food sovereignty meaning actual domestic production, not generating revenues to import food and, and energy from, from other places. So the, the third component of the structural weaknesses has to do with uh, the type of industrialization we typically uh, see in the global south since the early days of independence, which is specializing in low value added content of manufacturing. Uh, so this is where south-south uh, strategic partnerships to form larger networks of industrial capacity with complementary uh, sets of resources and capabilities, prioritizing the key areas of resilience or key areas of vulnerability for the region in order to industrialize on a, uh, on a, on a proper path as opposed to building industries that serve the global supply chains but don't really have any local economic impact in terms of building industrial capacity in, in the long term. And the problem with those types of investments uh, foreign direct investment and export oriented investments is that number one, the decisions to invest and in what to invest are made abroad. So your economy is still controlled and steered from abroad. Number two, it's still extractive. It's part of the structural traps that I talked about, because the, the more you try to attract investments, uh, foreign direct investment, you, you end up specializing obviously in the lower value added content. So you have to import capital, the intermediate goods, you have to race to the bottom in terms of wage costs and, uh, and environmental regulations, labor regulations, because you're competing with so many other countries who are trying to do the same. So the, the net result is actually a, a net extraction of resources. Um, and for FDI, it's even worse because even the profits generated are repatriated rather than reinvested in the country. So it's, it's really about rethinking the mode of economic development, escaping the structural traps that we've seen. Um, and, it's, and it's not easy, but it's even harder when you don't even recognize that it's a trap and keep digging yourself into it, hoping that somehow the effects will, uh, will, be, will be different. Um, so that's, that's where I would, I would start. Very good question. Okay, uh, Karina and Dongo, do you have anything to add to this question? Um, and if not, the next question is on sanctions, um, which is the, the full question is there in the chat. I'm not gonna read the entire thing, but talking about uh, unilateral coercive sanctions that we see now from the US side as the dominant system and how they've been used against uh, Iran, Afghanistan, recently Russia, and actually I can add to that list Venezuela as well, and how these unilateral sanctions for these countries can sort of make or break the solvency of these na nations and access to liquidity. And from the perspective of sovereignty, what could these countries do and can they pursue alternative to the dollar-based system? Would an alternative be possible, for instance, with a Chinese project? Well, this is a very tough question. I'm not sure I have the adequate answers. 
But I think that um, those countries are obliged to dealing from the dollar system because they have no choice. Uh, you know, um, <laughs> normally we were taught that, well, in capitalism, you have to respect the uh, rights of property, the rights of investors. So when people accumulate U.S. dollars and they could be, uh, they could, their assets could be seized at any time, that means that the rules of the game are no longer respected and people will have to find other alternatives. But the thing is that uh, in the current world, um, I do not see, uh, let's say, the Chinese currency replacing the U.S. dollar. But at the same time, people will look for alternatives to the U.S. dollar. So my bet would be that uh, we will go uh, into a multipolar world. That means that we will have different types of trade and financial integration. Uh, obviously, the role of the dollar will diminish, but it will not diminish at a point that it would be rivaled, let's say, by the Chinese uh, currency or any other currency. So we'll have, let's say, uh, let's say, more multipolarity in the financial world. But this will be, let's say, a gradual uh, <clears throat> evolution, not... Um, Let's say it we won't happen. Let's say we will not have a financial revolution. That's that would be my bet. So, yeah. May I just add to that? I, I agree with your evaluation. Uh, um, and uh, I I think here we are we are moving towards a sort of more multilateral system. The role of the dollar the dollar is not challenged, and this I think. There should be clarity in, in, in global South countries about the need to advocate uh, for a reform of the international monetary system. It links a little bit with my presentation, because here we will have this kind of diversification, um, financial diversification, uh, but still uh, it will be asymmetric in terms of development prospects for countries. The dollar will not be replaced. And because of all the, I think there will be collective action, action problems in terms of powers that will try um, to kind of uh, internationalize their currencies. But I, I agree that maybe China will not want to take on this role. Uh, but at the same time, I think here is there, there is this opportunity to kind of revive certain structural reform proposals, like they, uh, so, something along the lines of an international clearing union, right? what I was saying uh, earlier. Um, and here, the idea is that uh, the, the International Clearing Union sought to avoid the accumulation of imbalances between different uh, constituencies and jurisdictions. So, and th there was this international unit of account, right, the banker, and this unit of account was distinct from all national currencies. Uh, and there was this system of money creation and destruction that uh, it did not operate as a fiat money system, but it operated, uh, I mean, the, the, the original proposal, right? Through overdraft facilities and multilateral compensation. And then there was this symmetric distribu distribution of the burden between creditor and debtor countries. So here, I mean, I'm not saying this is anywhere uh, kind of um, politically um, possible right now, but my main concern is that I think this is not even kind of uh, considered by most Global South countries due to lack of uh, expertise on this matter. So it's important to kind of build diplomatic networks and kind of work towards the understanding that that's where we should go for in terms of building a structural um, framework where development is uh, allowed to all the constituencies in the international monetary system equally. So yeah, that that's just my thoughts on this. I would just add um, maybe two. Sorry for that. For that. <laughs> Looks like you're going. Okay, um, I just add really two quick points. Um, one is about you know the the status right and the development of the Chinese currency as a potential alternative. I agree that. Um, there is a potential, but still, you know, dollar right now um, accounts still for about 59% or 60% of the international reserve currency, and that is not going to change in anytime soon. Especially, I think, with the geopolitical instability, um, you know, there is this actually tendency of, you know, so-called so flight to the quality, right? So the dollar now becomes, I think, even more desirable, um, and you think see a lot of, um, you know, in the recent um, times, 
because of pandemic, because of geopolitical instability, we see a lot, a lot of actually of um, outflows of uh, of capital from developing and emerging markets. I have a slide that um, unfortunately I was not able to show, but um, we have seen this large outflows not only from China but also from other countries. And so um, it's unclear that dollar is really on the decline, as some of the people would argue. You know, most you know Ray Dalio has been saying the dollar is going to you know basically you know on the decline. But again, I'm not sure that it's really um, what we are seeing right now. Um, and then I think from the Chinese perspective, um, one of the things to really internationalize RMB as they um, have desired to do so, but then at the same time, you would need to allow for the rest of the world to get the, the, the Chinese yuan, which means China would have to accept, right, um, large trade deficit. Um, and that is not clear something that the government, uh, the Chinese authority is willing to do. Um, and then I think the last point is, yes, I think the multipolar sort of currency system would be the best bet, or if we could have some kinds of reform of the, you know, the, the um, special drawing rights. Um, but again, that is kind of um, <laughs> glim, I would say, the, the, the hope. So um, I, I agree that there's no easy solution um, at this point. And now just, sorry, maybe you can incorporate your response in closing remarks. We're getting a bit, you know, close sure. to the end of our panel. And the last question there in the chat is too on there's the time constraints on the climate crisis and what if you want to weigh in on methodology of change. So maybe also for closing remarks, if you want to think of that and just, you know, two mi minutes quickly sort of wrap up the conversation. Um, I guess in terms of order, um, we can start maybe with the opposite order of how we started. So we can start with Fadel okay. now and sure. just go. And <laughs> no problem. Uh, so just to kind of try to wrap up and uh, incorporate some of the some of the comments. Uh, one of my biggest areas of interest in terms of addressing these issues is is actually. Um, building the the um the knowledge base uh, and the recognition in the global south on the on the diplomatic level on the on the government level on the grassroots level that there are solutions and the solutions uh face the obstacles that we've discussed today so as uh as professor patricio earlier said that there is no political acknowledgement even that these are the issues so we're aiming at the wrong issues uh, and that uh, includes climate change and, and so on uh, number two, what I would like to conclude with in, in response to some of the discussion is, yes, we we want a, a different international financial system, and it's not necessarily replacing the dollar dominance with another currency dominance. It's more of the multi-polar uh, system. From a, from a single country, developing country perspective, my goal shouldn't be, you know, what can we do to replace the dollar so that we can have more freedom? The, the priority should be how can I build more resilience to external shocks and how can my neighbors who also face the same uh, uh, constraints and, uh, and problems build that resilience in an international financial system that's actually facilitating that resilience as opposed to hindering the resilience. And that includes a whole host of things. One is you know, prioritizing domestic investment and domestic mobilization of financial resources as opposed to reinforcing central bank independence and, and austerity and having the strategic investments that really allow you to build on that uh, on that resilience, starting with food and energy security and a different kind of industrialization that prioritizes uh, higher, higher value added content at the local and at the regional uh, level. Number two, uh, having uh, uh, a, a sort of uh, a multipolar international swap system, because we do have the international central bank swap system kind of exclusive to the club around the Fed and the ECB, that has to be much more generalized. And number three, as, as Jan, uh, Jan suggested earlier, rethinking the SDR allocation system, rethink the role of the IMF and actually stabilizing the international financial system, not necessarily going all the way to Keynes's vision but adapting that uh, vision to the needs of the international uh, financial system today. 
so we can actually manage to address major issues like climate change. And anything other than that is going to keep us in the same situation. Thank you again. Thank you. And Dongo? Okay, thank you, Lara. Uh, I will uh, conclude by um, addressing quickly uh, the argument that uh, MMT can't be applied in developing countries. I know that Yang Yang uh, uh, talked about that. In fact, uh, there are three problems with that. Uh, the first is that this view does not acknowledge the difference between MMT, uh, let's say, as a set of policies and MMT as a theoretical tradition. Uh, there is uh, nothing wrong with MMT as a theoretical tradition, and there are many things you could understand using the MMT tradition. For example, in the case of the colonialism, if you want to understand what was colonialism, you need, for example, MMT. Uh, the second thing is that those who tend to say that MMT can be applied, I think they also tend to be very optimistic about what the developing countries could achieve within the current structures of trade, finance, and investment. And um, they tend also to subscribe to this naive view about economic catch-up. The last uh, thing is that they also tend to obscure the uh, development space that is achievable uh, by developing countries. And this requires uh, to rely first and foremost on domestic resources and uh, choosing appropriate technologies. Why I say that? Because developing countries, they have very basic problems. For example, they need to have access to schools, to have access to water, etc., to jobs. And if there are people telling them, well, uh, MMT can be applied, so you need some finance or you need, uh, let's say, foreign investment to have your schools, to have, let's say, access to water. I think this is not something that is clearly coherent with what is happening in most uh, uh, countries uh, across the global south. So MMT, I think, is a very powerful lens. And I, my belief is also that any alternative development strategy uh, must adopt an MMT-like approach. Thank you. Jan, yeah, you're muted. Oh, I think it's uh, Karina's turn. Um. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I, I just, uh, I think that many things that were already said are interesting and I totally agree, especially in relation to how you can achieve monetary sovereignty, further monetary sovereignty by developing your uh, own productive capacity and, and industrial complexity. That's really important. So we need to kind of, I think bring discussions about industrial policy to the debate, which is something that I think hasn't been developed yet. Uh, not, I think, in the MMT community. Of course, this, yeah, they've been uh, extensively developed in uh, kind of well, maybe other communities, but this would be interesting. Uh, so I, I totally agree with that. Um, and I think here, my kind of just to as a summary of my, my key takeaway is that uh, sovereign debt crisis in the current system, uh, even though you can expand your um, monetary sovereignty to a certain extent, they are um, structural, structural to the system because there is only so much you can expand your monetary sovereignty if your currency is a subordinate currency. So the level of monetary sovereignty is constrained by currency hierarchy, and and here I think, yeah, it this is this is what it brings me to a debate about structural reforms, right? That we need. So both things are important. We can we can expand the level of monetary sovereignty. Also, I think it's important to think about structural um, debates in terms of how the monetary system, international monetary system, works. And here. Uh, I think we need to kind of revive this debate. I think Raul was asking about bunker. I'm not saying, yeah, let's just adopt that, you know, kind of copy paste the template. Um, but I think we should seriously kind of bring this discussion to, uh, to the kind of revive the discussion, right? To current debates. We need something like that. So if, if you want uh, like a, a quick answer, like Raul is asking, yes, but not necessarily copy paste. 
but that that's where we should move towards because those two those two things are important so in the shorter term i think there will be further uh, sovereign debt problems in the periphery due to monetary tightening at the moment we need kind of you know shorter term solutions like the sdr would be one especially kind of changing certain arrangements within the imf to allow um, countries to kind of donate SDRs to each other uh, and expanding the SDR allocation, but also uh, kind of we need to move towards structural discussions. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, so I would just um, first of all uh, recap what I you know argued that I think that MMT is an evolving body of theories that is built on really rich but coherent heterodox traditions. And so um, so that's what gives it, I think, the, the, the vibrancy that it's ongoing, you know, the, this construction of the theories will never sort of end. And, you know, it will take into account all these different needs, right? So I think what really um, allow MMT to provide insight to, to developing world is exactly this idea there is no one size fits all kinds of solutions. Um, and it's a good supplemental to uh, many of the structural developmental theories in providing a framework um, to understand the developmental constraints, the vital role of domestic financing at the state and um, private level, um, the understanding of the hierarchy of international monetary system, the space and effects of you know, fiscal monetary employment, industrial trade, et cetera, um, policies. Um, and I do welcome, you know, I think we all welcome constructive criticisms and that help us to you know, really refine and develop the theories to really take into account all the, you know, institutional, historical, political um, nuances, right? That really the, the specific challenges that are faced by the developing world. Um, and quickly on the on the point about, you know, multi, you know, sort of polar system, um, I think really money is too important to just leave it to others. We definitely need to, um, you know, put it in, at the center, right, of our um, advocacy and activism. So I think, um, Yes, we wanted to have alternative system, but who is going to be the agent, right, that leads that change? And if we don't have a, you know, coalition, right, in the global south to build that sort of um, strength and power, um, then very quickly the system is going to be taken away, right, by by them. Um, so I know that, you know, I, I'm hoping, right, China is able to play um, a more sort of uh, uh leading role in, in this, right? But definitely needs to partner with the Global South with many of these developing countries to not just let the rulemaking, um, you know, let the West, right? Let the, let the North take that rulemaking uh, power. Um, so, you know, it, it is clear that the US is fighting, you know, this sort of, um, I would say this resistance, right? Um, troubling. You, you just heard the William Burns, the CIA director, said, you know, despite Russia's aggression and so on, China is really the long-term challenge. Um, so I think it's clear that, um, you know, if if we can all act together, right? If that coalition can be built, this could, um, in a way, impose um, some pressure, right, uh, on the current sort of status quo um, in the global system. And so I'm hoping that pressure can continue to build um, through, you know not just in the scholarly um, reign, of course, but really through activism and um, all the great work that you guys have been doing. So um, that's all from me. Thank you again. Thank you very much. And thank you for to the panelists. Thank you to the organizers and everyone who joined. And hopefully see you all again soon. <laughs>